Anxiety takes many forms, and every single one of us experiences anxiety. We will all experience anxiety many times in our lives. Anxiety can be an important adaptive mechanism that has definite survival benefits in times of stress, when a heightened response is necessary. Appropriate levels of anxiety can help us to cope with our environment and protect us from harm. Adaptive anxiety helps our bodies and minds to cope with a real threat. Two examples of situations where anxiety can be helpful would be during an athletic event or a job interview. In both of these situations, a certain level of anxiety is both normal and beneficial and can enhance performance. Too much anxiety in either of these situations would be against our best interests and would harm our performance of the task. Anxiety about either of these situations at the wrong time would also be maladaptive. For example, lying awake the night before an interview ruminating about the possible questions you might be asked and imagining your potential disastrous responses. Chronic anxiety extreme anxiety or anxiety inappropriate to a situation are maladaptive and prevent us from coping successfully with our environment. As we all know, anxiety can be a very unpleasant experience and, if not managed, can lead to fear responses and a range of behaviors and emotions that would be perceived as mental health problems. Maladaptive or pathological anxiety varies from person to person. It will vary, for example, with frequency and intensity, level of perceived suffering, individual response, and how it affects the individual's functioning. Someone who had trained for a career in the hospitality industry would have their functioning severely affected if they developed anxiety to social situations. Maladaptive or pathological anxiety responds well to professional help with the use of both medication and various types of psychotherapy. Some people seek their own non-professional solutions such as alcohol or recreational drugs. Some practice rituals to hold off the feelings of anxiety, while others use avoidance of the anxiety producing stimulus. For example, using an escalator instead of an elevator to avoid feelings of claustrophobia. Some people look to animals to reduce their feelings of anxiety, commonly called emotional support animals or ESAs. We are all familiar with them through stories in the media about their impact on society, particularly travel arrangements. It is about ESAs that I want to talk now. Emotional support animals are different to service animals in that service animals have to be trained to carry out a specific task. Emotional support animals have no such training. Their mere presence supposedly brings about the supporting effect that the owner claims. Any species of animal can be used as an ESA, but for the sake of simplicity, I will mainly refer to the role of the dog as ESA. The dog is the one most commonly used, and it is the one that we mainly read about or hear about in the media. These media reports usually refer to emotional support animals on planes, although ESAs will accompany their owner in any situation in which the owner feels that the dog will provide the support that they need. The ESA dog can accompany their owner to any public setting such as a market or store, museum or sports event. People have brought or tried to bring other species of animals on planes to support them during a flight. Here are some examples. In 2016, Jason Ellis brought his emotional support marmoset on a flight to Las Vegas. Megan Peabody took her 70-pound emotional support pig on a flight to help support her with her anorexia. In 2016, Carla Fitzgerald took her emotional support duck on a flight from Charlotte to Asheville, North Carolina. An emotional support tortoise flew in 2015. 
Other animals that have flown in the passenger section of planes as emotional support animals include kangaroos, ponies, roosters, monkeys, hamsters, squirrels, snakes, lizards, and llamas. One animal that was refused permission to fly was an emotional support peacock. As well as a variety of different species being used as emotional support animals, it is claimed that a wide variety of disorders or conditions can be benefited by the presence of an emotional support animal. I have concentrated on anxiety because anxiety and anxiety-related conditions are most widely written about. Earlier, I mentioned the emotional support pig used to help with anorexia. But other conditions in which ESAs are claimed to be of benefit include depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, attention deficit disorder, autism, learning disorders, gender identity, and cognitive disorders. This sounds too good to be true, and that is what I want to investigate. What evidence is there to support these claims? The most common body of evidence is self-reporting. People will say that having their dog or other animal near to them makes them feel better, or it relaxes them, or it gives them comfort and confidence. Surely that's enough evidence? Well, it's not. There is no doubt that most of us get pleasure from animals. I have spoken in previous videos about the enjoyment I get from observing the hummingbirds outside of my window. The popularity of wildlife programs on TV shows that people like watching animals. Animals can make us feel calm and relaxed, but there is a big gap between saying that you like doing something and claiming it has therapeutic benefits for severe mental distress. There are lots of things that we enjoy doing or that give us satisfaction, but we don't then go on to claim that they have therapeutic benefits, particularly with severe psychiatric disorders. Having their dog with them all of the time may make people feel better, but they are now locked into a circle of dependency on an animal. They are now in a situation in which spontaneous behavior is very limited. They can do very little without their dog. Independence is gone. There is an argument that if something makes you feel better, then surely it must be therapeutic. When someone with obsessive compulsive neurosis taps the door handle 20 times before they open the door, it will dampen down their anxiety and they will feel better but they are prisoners of their ritualistic behavior. The attempt to relieve the negative feelings becomes as much a problem and as limiting as the negative feelings themselves. A feedback loop may develop. For example, compulsive shopping behavior may accompany depression, but it may also create feelings of depression with more compulsive shopping in an attempt to alleviate the depression. The relief behavior can amplify the problem. If you rely on the presence of a dog to get you through a plane journey, you are going to need the dog for the next plane journey and the next and the next. This is no kind of therapy. There is no progress or personal development. Relying on a dog or any other animal can prolong the mental distress and prevent progress. It is a dead-end strategy. The concept of the emotional support animal is so widely held and so fiercely defended that it must surely have a solid scientific basis. The answer to that is that it does not have a scientific basis. Someone who has written widely on this subject is psychologist Hal Herzog, and this is what he has to say on the subject. He says there is a lack of scientific evidence backing the need for emotional support animals, and there is doubt about whether there is any psychological benefit. But he does say it is a difficult area to study. 
quote, the degree to which they alleviate anxieties associated with travel is unclear, end quote. Lots of studies have found that interacting with animals can provide short-term stress relief. But there is no empirical evidence that having your dog or turtle sitting with you on a plane will overcome your fear of flying. He also says that there are few, if any, good empirical studies on the effectiveness of emotional support animals for psychiatric problems. This is why the Veterans Administration will not pay for emotional support animals for veterans with PTSD. This is what the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs has to say about service dogs and PTSD. Quote, Recovering from PTSD is a process. Evidence-based treatments for PTSD help people do things they have been avoiding because of their PTSD, such as standing close to a stranger or going into a building without scanning it for danger first. Evidence-based treatments can also help people feel better. Dogs can help you deal with some parts of living with PTSD, but they are not a substitute for effective PTSD treatment. Although people with PTSD who have a service dog for a physical disability or emotional support dog may feel comforted by the animal, there is some chance they may continue to believe that they cannot do certain things on their own. For example, if the dog keeps strangers from coming too close, the owner will not have a chance to learn that they can handle this situation without the dog. Becoming dependent on a dog can get in the way of the recovery process for PTSD. Based on what we know from research, evidence-based treatment provides the best chance of recovery from PTSD, end quote. A major problem associated with emotional support animals is that it is open to considerable fraud, with people fraudulently claiming to have mental distress so that they can have their dog with them at all times, or so that they can get round no pets clauses in leases. To many people, this idea of emotional support animals is just another aspect of the selfish entitlement and rule bending carried out by dog worshippers. In common with the animal abuse carried out in the name of animal love, the emotional support animal concept is another form of abuse. It is hard to know how much stress an animal might suffer on a flight. There is no way of assessing the animal's perceptions of being taken to an airport, a novel environment, and having to cope with a range of new and unusual experiences so that the owner is able to travel. As in the case of bestiality, it is impossible for the animal to be asked or to provide consent. Any benefit in the animal-human relationship is one way. It is solely for the benefit of the human, and it is for the benefit of one human only, with little or no concern for any other humans. The case of Dexter the Peacock is a good example of this. When the owner was refused boarding permission, she remained in the airport for several hours along with the peacock, which spent its time perched atop her luggage. It is difficult to believe that this is in the best interests of the animal. The story of Rachel Taylor is an example of the level of selfishness being practiced with emotional support animals on planes. When she was 10 years old, she was mauled by her aunt's golden retriever. The dog ripped off her eyelid, and her skull was exposed. She had several months of reconstructive surgery, and 13 years later, she still has problems with her tear ducts, and she has a large scar on her face. In 2017, when she was preparing to board a plane at Boston Logan Airport, she noticed a large emotional support dog about to board the same plane as her. She says she was unnerved and wrote that, quote, with the increase in emotional support animals on planes as well as in housing, 
it's becoming harder for me to find spaces where I feel safe, end quote. Many of us will be familiar with this feeling. She concludes with the following observations, quote, a law has decided whose emotional needs are more important than others. There are no laws stating that because I have post-traumatic stress with dogs, others need to take my well-being into consideration. And I don't even think I would want that. I don't want to need special treatment. I hate showing up to a new friend's house, unaware that they have a dog, and explaining to them why they either need to put the dog in a closed room or I have to leave. I am not implying that my needs are more significant than another's, but I don't agree with how a law has decided whose emotional needs are more important. I was attacked by a dog. Now I don't want to sit next to someone's animal while I'm on a plane. Why should I have to be the one to move to accommodate them? End quote. Her account speaks to the level of entitlement that dog worshippers think is their due. There are alternatives to emotional support animals. The obvious one is for the person to take responsibility for their problems and seek solutions that are tested and effective. In other words, the solution rests with emotional support humans. Emotional support humans, or ESHs, can respond to you, can provide guidance and information, can suggest strategies, and educate you in new ways of reacting to situations. Dogs will do none of these things. They offer a similar level of support to that offered by a lucky charm. Like dogs, lucky charms appear to work. A study published in the Association for Psychological Science described how lucky charms might actually be effective. Two similar experiments were described. In one, volunteers were asked to put a golf ball four feet into a hole. Most failed miserably. Then half were told that they were playing with a lucky ball. In the other experiment, the task was one involving manual dexterity. Half of the group were told, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for you. In both experiments, the magic groups outperformed the non-magic group, demonstrating that confidence and expectation had an effect on performance. It may be that emotional support animals operate like lucky charms to some extent. If the owners expect the animal to reduce their anxiety, then their anxiety is reduced and their confidence grows. There are, of course, massive problems with using animals as lucky charms, particularly on planes. Animals bite. They frighten people. They smell. They make disturbing noises. They void body wastes. And they pollute the atmosphere. Wouldn't it be simpler and more sociable to invest your superstition in a lucky dime or a lucky t-shirt or a lucky pair of dice? Then we would have one less thing to worry about when we are flying. The future is dog-free.